Yes, I, I'm following the, 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 the general title of, uh, of your meeting. Uh, the general title is, uh, what is it? Uh, <laughs> fragmentation, liqui liquidity fragmentation and individualization in the mediascapes. Yes, I'm going to talk essentially about uh, uh, fragmentation. <clears throat> Let me say something about the, the story of this presentation. Uh, I've, been, I've been working on, uh, on the issue of media fragmentation uh, since a couple of years. Then uh, uh, last October, uh, uh, last October in, uh, in Ljubljana, I, I, I guess you were there, uh, if I'm not wrong, at the meeting in Ljubljana. There was a presentation from uh, 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 one colleague from Tirana. And at a certain point, he said that in Tirana, a capital of Albania, not a big city, uh, there are 25 dailies. 25 dailies in a city like Tirana. What's going on there? So uh, too many dailies for a city of uh, around one million inhabitants, if I'm not wrong. So what's going on? What is the, the issue? So uh, I started working uh, more and more on this issue of, uh, of uh, uh, fragmentation. And uh, I've been looking also for, for data. And uh, I, I went to the data of the uh, uh, World Association of Newspapers and the European Audiovisual Observatory, and I took from them some data. Uh, how does it work here? How shall I go on? Sorry, I am a, a Mac person. No. Doesn't seem to work. What's happening? Uh, what do you mean? I didn't do anything <laughs> wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. I think it takes time. Somehow it takes slow. some time. Okay, it's a slow computer. Okay, uh, and I put this data. What did I do? I divided the number of inhabitants of uh, each country for the number of media outlets, uh, daily print press and television news outlets. Uh, these data, in a, in a way, are disappointing because they don't say too much. I thought to find some kind of possible typology, and instead there is no typology. There is no distinction, clear distinction between uh, South and North Europe, uh, between Western Europe and Central Eastern Euro Europe. Uh, uh, there is no possible classification, no possible, uh, as I say, typology. Uh, they say a lot, but not pointing out any sort of possible typological interpretation. Uh, we go from uh, a, a country like Estonia, where you have one daily press each 85, 89,000 inhabitants, and uh, television outlets uh, each every 83, 75,000 inhabitants, to Poland, which has uh, one daily every 673 inhabitants and one television. Uh, every 95,000. So there is no possible cl classification. Uh, what can I say about, what I can say about this data is that uh, the, 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 the number of outlets may depend on different, uh, uh, on different reasons. For instance, the, 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 the dimension of a country. Of course, Russia is a big country, and of course, there are a lot of different newspapers, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, television sets. Sweden, Sweden, there are very many television and print uh, um, print news outlets because probably of uh, the old tradition of uh, press subsidies uh, that push for having uh, uh, newspapers 
from uh, all different minorities, religion, ethnic, linguistic minorities. Uh, Italy, for instance, why we have uh, 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 not a big concentration of print press and we have uh, uh, many television outlets because uh, television money from advertising go to television goes to television not to print press so there are few uh, print press uh, outlets so there are different uh, explanations depending uh, on essentially on uh, on different uh, on different uh, uh, contingent and uh, contextual uh, explanation. Uh, so geographical dimension, past history, unequal distribution of advertising resource, but in general, in general what comes out from this data that uh, yes, today there is a, a sort of John Keane, as this, uh, I'm using his words, uh, there is an abundance of news outlets. As he, John said, we live in the era of media abundance. Uh, there is a, a very uh, deep, a very dramatic fragmentation of the media system. We are facing a large number of opportunities of sources of information, many news outlets. This is what the, 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 the main, uh, the main uh, result of this data that, yes, we live in the era of fragmentation. We live in the era of, uh, of media, uh, of media uh, abundance. Now, uh, the, the question that this data race is the following. Uh, when, uh, as in the case of Tirana, we have uh, 25 days, is this good or is this bad? Uh, good means that in Tirana there is uh, a very good level of pluralism. But at the same time, the question that raises is, uh, are these 25 days able to survive by themselves? This is the question. So on one side, we have, uh, uh, we have pluralism. What shall I do here? Wait, OK. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is what I want to point out, that on one side, yes, fragmentation, as we say, may foster pluralism many sources of information, many different sources of information competing each other. But at the same time, fragmentation may also be an indicator of instrumentalization. That means when we have 25 uh, dailies in a city of one million of inhabitants, the question is uh, how they can survive by themselves. Are they able to find resources to circulate all resources are coming from outside. That means there are uh, external organizations supporting, uh, supporting the life of these 25 dailies. And this goes to the issue of instrumentalization, because if someone puts money on the news outlet, it means that uh, uh, this person, this organization, wants something from the news outlet. That means that very often this news outlet is, uh, is, is used for some kind of instrumentalization goals, and not just for spreading, for spreading news. So fragmentation may mean good level of pluralism, but at the same time is a risk of uh, media instrumentalization. That means the media are not used for spreading news, but they are instrument to reach goals of different nature within politics, but also within the business sectors. And moreover, the problem is that when you have a very rich media system, when you have a very high level of fragmentation, you have uh, uh, fragmentation implies, as I wrote, uh, uh, audience segmentation. That means in a very crowded media system, each news outlet is looking for its own niche audience. Not anymore for mass audience, but each media outlet addresses 
its own niche audience. So there is a, a tendency to a segmentation of a, 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 of a market. And most of the times, this is the problem. Uh, let me say something about niche audience. There is a very, this very good book by uh, Natalie Jomini Stroud. The title is ex uh, exactly Niche Audience, in which she explained very well how what is going on in the United States with, uh, the, 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 in the era of media abundance. That means we are forgetting the idea of a mass audience and niche audiences are replacing the old idea of, uh, of mass audience. At this regard, let me also remind me I'll uh, remind you the, the title of a very interesting paper that Elio Katz wrote in the 60s. And the title of the paper was very clear at this regard. And deliver us from segmentation. That means, yes, abundance is good, segmentation is good, but there are risks in uh, with the idea of segmentation. Uh, Ilio was pointing out that segmentation implies the end of mass audience. Segmentation implies and also the end of uh, that common square where different uh, uh, points of view could meet and could negotiate each other. So deliver us from segmentation. In the era of, notion, of niche audience, we are giving up with, uh, uh, with uh, the common square where different uh, points of view could meet. Uh, now each point of view lives within its own uh, segmented uh, market, within its own segmented audience. So fragmentation is good because it's pluralism, but also because it implies, it implies segmentation. Now, what is the issue? The issue is that uh, the, 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 the increased fragmentation uh, of the old media goes together with uh, uh, the new media fragmentation, the fragmentation created by internet. That means uh, internet increases enormously. The number of opportunities of communication increases enormously. The number of uh, possible media outlets and increases the level of uh, fragmentation of a media system. So we have a fragmentation of a traditional media system because we have a commercialization, because we have a lot of television outlets, we have a lot of print press outlets, even if we know that print, uh, print media are, are in crisis and, uh, and newspapers are closing in many other parts of the world. But if traditional print media are closing, there are free press uh, developing everywhere so the level of uh, the, 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 we are facing a very crowded all media market and moreover we have an enormous number of opportunities offered by by the by the internet now the issue I, I want to discuss with you is the following that when we face segmentation most of times segmentation is based on cultural, ideological, and political segmentation. Not anymore, not just on a traditional demographic segmentation, but mostly when you have a national media system or when you have a, a over national media system as the internet that is not addressing that just national media system, in most cases, the segmentation of the internet, the segmentation of the traditional media market uh, implies political and ideological and cultural segmentation. And the risk that, the risk that uh, Elio Katz was pointing out in the 60s, deliver us from segmentation, may become greater because if we live in the era of abundance, uh, means that we live uh, in the era of a segmented, uh, ideolo ideologically and politically and culturally segmented media market. And the problem is uh, the following. So on one side, fragmentation fosters pluralism. Fragmentation may foster control of a government, of course, because we have a, lo a lot of a, a, a large number of opportunities of communication. We have a lot of opportunities of controlling the government because internet is, of course, an occasion to control the rulers. 
uh, and we have an enormous av availability of sources of information. But uh, we have to take into account also which are the risks of this fragmentation. So on one side, opportunities for democracy, control over government, more opportunities, more availability of different and competing sources of information. So abundance, good, good for democracy. But are there risks coming from this level of fragmentation? And this is what I would like to discuss which, with you. Which are the risks coming out from uh, this situation of media abundance, from this situation of uh, media uh, fragmentation? And here are the point. <clears throat> uh, the risk of fragmentation. First of all, political polarization. I, in some way, this is the, uh, the most dramatic risk that I see in the era of a media abundance. Because if, if fragmentation implies uh, market segmentation, as I said before, uh, market segmentation is essentially based on cultural, political, and ideological segmentation. That means each niche audience, <clears throat> the daily me of Kassenstein, uh, that means uh, each niche audience talk to within its own. Uh, I refer just to people with whom I share already existing opinions. And uh, I'm not looking for new opinions, but I'm just looking for reinforcing the already existing uh, opinions, faith, uh, knowledge, and so on. So these opinions are just reinforced, are just polarized. And Jomini Stroud used the word of partisan selective exposure. In a very crowded media market, uh, what is going on is more and more partisan selective exposure. That means I'm not looking for novelties, but I'm just looking, I'm just looking for being reinforced, being confirmed in the already existing uh, opinions. And this may bring to polarization, to <clears throat> reinforcing the already existing divisions within a society. Because as Elio Katz already said in the, in the 60s, the common square that was produced by mass audience is disappearing in front of a segmented media market. So polarization. Of a, of, a, of a society. And probably uh, this is what is going on in the United States today. There, there are many books and many research that are pointing out how the, 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 the political polarization of the of United States is not depending on September 11, it's not depending on the, on the election of the black uh, Obama, it's not depending just on the uh, health system uh, reform, but it's depending also on uh, the segmentation of the media market. It's depending on the action of uh, Fox News, uh, on the action of different uh, media, uh, media talk show, and so on. So in some way, there are many different explanations on uh, uh, how our Western society are becoming more and more polarized, even because of uh, this new segmentation of a, of a, of a, media, of a media market. Uh, but the second risk is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, another very dramatic risk, the complexity. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the era of abundance, the era of media abundance, is producing a higher level of social and political complexity. That means uh, the opportunities offered by the, by the internet, the opportunities offered by the large number of media outlets 
is increasing the complexity of a political system. Many new actors may enter the, 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 the political arena also because of media fragmentation. And I point in, I'm pointing out here the Italian case. Let me tell you something about the Italian case. You heard about the result of our elections of two months ago, where uh, <clears throat> there has been a sort of winning party, the leftist party, but then the second party has been a party, has been the Movimento Cinque Stelle, the Five Stars Movement, which is a movement which doesn't have any party structure. And most, what is more important for us is a movement that was born out from a blog. That, that means that 10 years ago, around 10 years ago, a famous showman, Beppe Grillo, started his own blog. And this, this blog has become more and more diffused, has spread a lot, has become more and more important. And finally, from, <clears throat> from a blog, Beppe Grillo started a political movement. And after a few years, this movement has become the second party in the Italian political landscape. Uh, think of a pirate's party in Germany and in Sweden. I uh, think also in Romania, I heard of, uh, of a party born out from, uh, 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 from a blog and from a, 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 a tel TV station. Uh, from a TV station. And, uh, so uh, the fragmentation of a, ma of, of a media market is increasing. The, the complexity of a political system. Because many new actors are uh, have the possibility to enter the political arena and starting from a news outlet, a political movement, a political party. And we are facing this situation in many, dif in many different parts of the world. Uh, what does it mean, uh, complexity? Not just that we are facing many actors, but that uh, political and, uh, uh, and social negotiations are becoming more and more complex because of the numbers of actors, because of, of, of many different interactions that different actors are able to place among themselves. So it's not just the number, but the, the decision-making process is becoming more complex because of larger opportunities of, of, of communication that exist today. So, on one side, polarization of political system. On the other side, also a more complex political system and more complex political and social negotiation. Uh, Post-bureaucratic organizations. This is the definition I, I take from Bruce Bimber in, in his book on the, uh, on the different kinds of uh, uh, of organizations linked to the, the different kind of, of, of the different kinds of media system, and what Bruce is pointing out that in the era uh, of media abundance we face post bureaucratic organizations. That means low level of institutionalization. What does it mean low level of institu institutionalization? that media abundance may foster the volatility of uh, the political and social system. Because we face today an organization, and this organization tomorrow will disappear. And the new organization will replace the old organization. So post-bureaucratic organization means volatility of uh, the social and political system in which we live. Good, because there are opportunities for participation, there are opportunities for uh, a higher level of democracy, but at the same time, complexity and volatility of a, uh, of a political system. Uh, the, the, the last risk of a fragmentation I see is, uh, this is in some ways, uh, I'm dubious about it. But uh, let me point. Let, uh, let let me put on the table lower level of capacity of uh, government scrutiny. That means uh, I was thinking of a New York Times 10, 15 years ago. If uh, the New York Times 10, 15 years ago was pointing out an issue, was criticizing the the U.S. government, the U.S. government because it was the New York Times. 
uh, reaching a large number of readers, probably the, the US government had to take into account what the criticism coming from uh, the New York Times. But now we are facing niche audiences. How are these niche audiences reaching less number of, uh, uh, of receivers able to perform the same level of scrutiny over government? This is an open question. That means once when we were facing mass audience, the level of scrutiny over government was in a way more powerful because a lot of people involved with, with mass audiences. Now, niche audiences are able to perform the, le the same level of scrutiny over government. This is not clear. Uh, the government can, can say, I don't, I don't mind about the activity of that particular a blog because it reaches a very small number of, uh, of users uh, I don't want. But if a, a large, a more important news outlet is pointing out some criticism, yes, I have to take into account. So the era of abundance, the era of fragmentation of media system may raise also this other issue. What is the capacity of, uh, 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 of <coughs> the control of the government when we are facing not anymore a mass audience, but we are facing many different competing uh, niche audiences? So in a way, fragmentation, good. But on one side, we have the risk of uh, instrumentalization, because when there are many news outlets, as the case of, of Tirana is pointing out, uh, probably these news outlets are not able to survive by themselves. They are not able to reach a, a sufficient number of uh, users. They are not able to get the sufficient number of uh, uh, advertising resources. So they need to be supported from <coughs> outside forces either business or political actors. So instrumentalization instead of uh, spreading news. And on the other side, of course, opportunities for democracy, because many different news outlets, many people can, can participate in the political, in the social, in the cultural life, but also the risk of polarization, uh, complexity of a, of a political system, and volatility of a political system because of post-bureaucratic post organization. And also the question is the, the possibility of scrutiny over government becoming higher or is becoming less uh, powerful than before. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. So the audience, please go for the questions. Is it Inka? First. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I liked very much your presentation, Paolo. And to the last point immediately. Uh, in Croatia, it used to be always in the past 20 years, in fact, that before the national election, uh, the ruling party would organize uh, many new small parties uh, to spring up so that the scene of the party scene would always be enlarged and so that a number of votes would be uh, dispersed from their opposition and so on. Well, of course, we, we always suspect that the ruling party, uh, which was in, mostly in power during the past 20 years, was behind this because there was no other reason but uh, to, to explain how this happens. So, and this, in a way, was diluting the, uh, the strength of the, the audience uh, and or the citizens in deciding the parties they want because they sort of uh, were lost uh, in the abundance of the choice. So perhaps um, when we look at, so I, so I think uh, you have something there in the, in the last uh, point, uh, with 25 uh, uh, newspapers in uh, one city, which is quite clear that it's impossible to be sustained on economic basis, on the basis of paying uh, by the audiences. Uh, it seems clear that uh, uh, many of those uh, media outlets in uh, Central and or maybe just Eastern Europe 
or southeastern Europe are politically motivated just for the reason to dilute the mass audience. So I think, uh, um, in a way, you're, you have um, found, I like the other points as well, but I think uh, the last one of, of reducing the possibility of scrutiny uh, once the audience is uh, no longer strong enough uh, is very important. And I also think this speaks, of course, to, to this uh, whole uh, uh, misguided uh, idea of a public sphere on the internet, uh, which is precisely impossible because of this fragmentation that you talk about. You know, Zrinika, more I, I, I attend meetings in, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, and more I see similarities with Italian situation. Someone, I don't remember who, was asking me, what do you think about the Italianization of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, who was asking me about the, the, what Boguslav said about the Italianization of Polish media system. This is the same strategy, for instance, that Berlusconi has used in Italy. Uh, to start small political organization to, to, to lower the, the, the strength of the opposition parties. So there are similarities uh, among uh, different countries and among different situations. And the, the complexity, the fragmentation is, um, I would say, uh, always good, but yes, it may respond to different strategic and Goals, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good night, and then. Oh. Thank you. Shall I get more questions together? What do you think? Yeah, I think yes. Let's please yeah. good night. If I remember, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the you. presentation. We we see just the same tendencies in, in Sweden. For example, <coughs> uh, an increasing social fragmentation between uh, elite media and uh, more uh, mass media. But we, we also see some tendencies that are working in the other direction. For, for example, uh, that we have a, a bigger and bigger media uh, concerns, media holdings, concentrations, holdings, yes, and they are sharing content between each other. Mm -hmm. So even if you have many outlets, very much of the content the are become just the same. And there is also this uh, mechanism in, in journalism, at least in Sweden, that different media outlets follow each other. If one says do something, everybody has to do the same, because they are afraid of in the hard competition to be lagging behind. Mm -hmm. So these are two tendencies that are <coughs> countering these uh, effects of fragmentation. And I wonder what you s if you see that in Italy, what do you say? Mm -hmm. I think that what you've provided is a very interesting food for thought, and I share the concern that you've expressed um, about the risks, the, the, how it will affect the public square. But then I started thinking back historically, and much of what is happening now also described the 19th century. In 1899, there were 25 daily newspapers in New York City. There were many newspapers in Berlin or Krakow for Paris. Um, they didn't communicate as well with each other. Minority populations were went unheard uh, to some degree. And I wonder if what we have is in, in 20th century was a kind of golden age of mass audience. And it was easier to study. We could talk uh, about media influence, looking at certain newspapers. And I wonder if that would change your perspective at all um, I'm uh, one, one more question. Uh, I think, uh, yes, okay. I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, your. Uh, just, um, I guess I just wanted to problematize the golden age of, mm -hmm. of mass audiences. I mean, you know, when I think about Lithuania and, and, and mass media, um, it, it doesn't seem like a a golden age, quite the way that I think you yeah, yeah. mean it. it. Might be a golden age for us in this room because, in some ways, we all benefited from kind of like that way of, of thinking, and it's disrupted not only for the media markets but for us individually, right, in our in our classrooms. Um, but but thinking about um, mass media vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, or if you like, I mean, the 1940s has got to be seen as a you know the era of mass media. Um, it didn't turn out so well. 
So I think we're absolutely right to think critically about fragmentation, but there's a danger in romanticizing the mass media period. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, May I? I? Yes, please. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> our last session. Uh, uh, let me say something. Uh, I don't forget, Gunnar, uh, your question. But uh, let me start with the golden age. Uh, there is a wonderful expression that uh, James Caron and Park have used in the de-westernizing media system. They talk of, uh, uh, we live in the, in the ideology of a media system that comes uh, from a tiny handful of countries. That means the golden age was just uh, a very short period related to a very sh small amount of countries. That was the United States and probably the United Kingdom. But in the other parts of the world, mass audience did not exist, was not relevant, was not important. Uh, so I would say that uh, if mass audience, the golden age, has existed, this was a very short experience in the history of the Western world and also was related to the experience of a tiny handful of countries, not the entire Western world, but essentially the United States and, and, Great, and Great Britain. And moreover, what the difference, uh, I gave a similar talk uh, a couple of weeks ago and there was a, a very similar uh, question to yours. So someone pointing out uh, you had this situation in, German, in Germany in the, uh, in the era of the Weimar Republic, fragmentation. Probably yes, but uh, there was not the internet. Uh, there was not the risk of, uh, of volatility. Think of a, of, a, of a speed of technological of a technological change, and this is a novelty. You cannot compare the speed of technological innovation today with the, the, the stability of a media system of the twenties of the thirties that were based on traditional print mass. Television did not exist, so uh, the, the, the situation may have some similarities, but technological change is putting on the table a completely new, uh, a completely different situation. So I would say, golden age, yes. But this was the golden age of the United States and Great Britain, probably for a very short period of time. Moreover, uh, the difference with the previous, with the past history, is the speed of change that technological innovation is spreading today. Concentration, uh, yes. But does similar concentration exist as to new media? This is the problem. Yes, concentration from for uh, for traditional media, for old media, for legacy media. You are right, absolutely right. But on the other side, does the same level of concentration exist as to the internet? All blogs are living by themselves. They don't need to be concentrated, even if there is a tendency to concentrate also in the in the in the sphere. Of, a, of the internet. Nevertheless, blogs live by, by, by themselves. And they are against concentration in a way. So, uh, Gunnar was also pointing that journalists are following each other and content becomes. Yes, uh, the, the, yeah, uh, this is absolutely. Uh, uh, could I go all on for 30 minutes about that? Because I'm working on, exactly on this. How the internet, for instance, the Twitter, is uh, is creating now a climate of opinions which is built up by journalists and politicians at the same time. So that the day after on the newspaper, you read a, a, a news that comes out from the agreement between all those who have tweeted. And they reach an agreement on what, on what to say at the end. But this is another topic, so sorry. We have another very quick round of questions, so bring yes. this up. Uh, my question is, Europe keeps this uh, tradition of public media. We have public media paid by the citizens. Uh, where you put public media in this 
fragmented uh, situation. Shall I answer this or shall we? Oh, yes. finish. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 I will answer with the words of Mark Thompson. Mark Thompson was the former director general of BBC, and uh, during a meeting, uh, I attended the meeting, uh, this was in Oxford, and he said that the, in this era of fragmentation, the, 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 the function of a, of a public service media is that of ensure the public square. That means, as we are facing media that try to reach its own audience, uh, it's just the public service media that can ensure the public square. So in the era of a fragmentation, if the government allows, because this is the question, uh, the, the, the function of public media is that, yes, that of uh, building again the public square that the te technology is destroying to, today. This is a mission. Uh, this is a possible mission, but are public, uh, public media officials uh, aware of this possibility? And do they want mm -hmm. to accomplish this goal? This is something else. But yes, if there is a function of public service media today is that of ensuring the public square that does not exist anymore. Okay. Uh, they want us. I want to ask you about your native country, Italy. About, sorry? About your native country, Italy. Uh, because uh, according to Freedom House uh, data, uh, Italy press is partly uh, free. Uh, how do you think? Uh, uh, put, uh, uh, the media have potential to foster more freedom to the media of Italy? Uh, I'll be sincere. Uh, 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 I think that this data are wrong. Uh, sorry to say <coughs> this, but I don't trust this data. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to defend my country because uh, there is no need to defend. I am very critical of my country. But I would say that Italian print press is absolutely free. Is completely free. Of course, there is Berlusconi, and as a politician, he tries to affect the the behavior of a print press. There is no doubt about that. But mostly, if you look at print press, most of print press in Italy is against Berlusconi. It's completely free. Of course, Berlusconi has its own newspaper, il giornale, and is able to influence another important newspaper, <coughs> Libero. But nevertheless, if you look at most of, uh, of Italian print press, uh, I don't agree at all with, uh, with uh, what uh, Freedom House and so on says about print press in Italy. And also as to, to television. Of course, Berlusconi has its own empire. No doubt about that. We know it very well. But is Berlusconi able to control public service media? He has been trying to control. And for a short period, he has been able to appoint the main director, the main editor of the main television newscast. Yes, definitely, yes. But now the situation is already changing. He's able to control public service media? Not at all. Not at all. So, uh, sorry again, but I don't think that the media system in Italy is partially free. It's free. Sorry. Uh, this is my point of view. Uh, the, I mean, the most, the, 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 the most diffuse, the most important current affair program, able to reach six millions of televiewers, is completely against Berlusconi. It's against, completely against the government. How can you define this uh, a partially free uh, media system? Sorry, disagree with this. <laughs>